Let's take a moment and go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for heat. Um, Father, without the sun shining on us, without this, we would not live. And you take care of us and provide us for us. And so um, we thank you for sunshine and warm, sweaty nights. And I ask that you be here in our midst, that we would hear your voice, that as we uh, talk about and your word and as we sing and as we eat together, um, that you would be near us, we would feel and know your presence. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're speaking through um, the Apostles' Creed. We've been working on it for a while, and tonight I'm doing a section um, called, um, it, it's the part where we talk about the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, those two elements together. Um, and so just to refresh our memories, uh, the Apostles' Creed is what we believe here at the village. It's the basic creed that we live by. It's what we say, this is true, and um, even if we have slightly different interpretations of what it might mean, together we say, this is a confession that we make. This is a statement of, of belief. And so if you can join with me, and it's something that you do believe as well, then um, would you say it with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. When we talk about the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, when we talk about those elements, we're talking about people gathered here. <laughs> we're talking about the Holy Catholic Church. The word holy means set apart. We're the set apart ones. We're people who have been set apart by God. We're set apart for a particular task. We're set apart to do things together, to be together. We're set apart. The word Catholic is a, a fantastically wonderful word. Um, often we think, we associate it with the Holy Catholic Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that is not what we're talking about. This is Catholic with a small c tonight. We're going to be talking about Catholic Church with a small c. I always love that when we get to that, we put a little asterisk, and then we put universal up there so that everybody kind of knows that it's something different. Um, however, universal isn't the right word either. Sorry, Julie, because I know you put that up there and, and, but because you were told to. <laughs> and, uh, and Julie does what she's told to do sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, um, we, we think of Catholic as as universal, but universal has a it's even it's the word Catholic is bigger than universal. The Catholic Church, the Holy Catholic Church that we claim is a church through all time and all place everywhere. The church here on earth, the church in heaven, the church that's gone before us, the church throughout history. Everywhere there are those who are holy and set apart for God, the church universal is this big, huge thing. The the, 
the purpose of the church and and why we're uh, why we're gathered together is also something that we're going to talk about in just a few moments. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Actually, the word church is an interesting word in Scripture. We think of church, and we think of this brick-and-mortar building. We think of this place that we come to. Some of you tonight said, hey, let's go to church. And you're sort of messed up. You're sort of wrong. Sorry. You don't go to church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the church. Now, if you're not a follower of church of Jesus, you can say, I went to the place where the church is gathered. Right? The word church in the Greek was simply those who were called out of their houses. If you left your house, you were at church. You got called out of your house. You went to an assembly, a gathering. You, you got out of the house. It's kind of an interesting word because it was used far more broadly than to define the group of believers that became what we call the church. So if you went to a political rally, you would be going to church. If you were going to uh, the mall to visit a whole bunch of friends, you were going to church. You were going to leave your house, and you're going to go become part of something that's bigger than you. The Some of us like to believe that we could do church at home by ourselves. <laughs> we don't need other people. That's wrong. You can't call yourself a church if you're meeting all by yourself in your house. It's not the same. Now you can have a bunch of people over, they all left their house, and they have joined the church. Okay, got it? So the Holy Catholic Church, it's the set-apart people through all time and place and space called out of their houses into an assembly into a gathering. And our purpose is communion of the saints. It is to join our hearts together, to be set apart and and to enjoy not only communion with each other, but communion with Jesus, communion with God. God has gathered us together for the purpose of knowing him more deeply, of worshiping and praising him, of meeting with him, of knowing and learning about him. Communion is also what we'll do in a little while when we take bread. When we break it, And we say, this is the body and blood of Christ. And we say, if you are part of the communion of the saints, then you take communion. This is called, we call it communion. Some call it the Eucharist. Some call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it taking the bread and wine. Some, we have different names for it. But it is joining ourselves with Christ. It's identifying with Christ. So tonight, if you want to identify with Jesus... If you want to say, hey, I belong to Jesus, I'm part of this group, a little bit later when we have a time of celebrating and worshiping together, come, take it, eat it, remember and believe what Jesus did for you. Never eat when you're giving a talk. And what's gathered here are called saints. Saints are interesting people. We don't think of ourselves as saints. Um, When you study the word saint, it is one who's been set apart, again, the holiness idea, 
but it's a cleaned up one. It's someone who's been cleaned, who's been washed. Saints are the cleaned up ones. So this is the gathering of the cleaned up ones. The Holy Catholic Church, the set apart to all time and space, those who have been called out of their house, who commune with Christ and each other, and are cleaned up. All of that is the definition of what we are when we gather together. When we think of that, we often think of the church as just this place. I think of of the village as the church that I go to. It's my church. People often say, Rod, I'd like to visit your church. I go, wow, if I had one, that'd be awesome, but I don't. God has a church, and it meets over there on Cloverland, or at least part of it does, a small little tiny section of it does, because we are not, the church isn't just this little building. The church is huge. When I say it's universal and big and monstrous and over all time and place, you have no idea what that really means. When Derek, my son, was in the hospital and people were praying for him, I would get letters and notes and emails and all kinds of things from people I have never met before. Because I would put something up on Facebook and people would post it and then they would forward it to somebody else and they would forward it to somebody else. And I discovered that a tribe of people in Nigeria were praying for Derek and a tribe in the mountains of Mexico that there were... that. Um, where there's a medical clinic, um, were praying for Derek. And, and, and there were people in Germany, and there were people in Japan, and there were people all over the world who are part of this thing we call the church, the Holy Catholic Church. So don't get wrapped up in the idea that the church is small. It's not. It's huge. But it's also small. Together here, we're called a church. We're called this church because we're called the village. And it's an important place because it's where we go out to. When we leave our house, we come and gather together here. And we minister and love each other. And we become a community here together. One of the great truths about the Church of Christ, is that it is together the body of Christ. The body of Christ. One Corinthians twelve twenty seven through thirty one says, "Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it." And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret but earnestly desire the higher gifts? And I will show you a more excellent way. This body of Christ. We are Christ's body. Colossians 1.24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. We're the church, we become the body of Christ. The body is an amazing thing. We have thousands and thousands and millions of little elements that all have to work together for our bodies to work. And when some of those stop working, when they don't work correctly, when they mess up, the whole body suffers. When Jesus calls us to be the church, when he calls us out of our houses to be together, he's calling us 
to help each other, serve each other, to do our part in the community where he places us. When the flu virus attacked Derek's lungs, his lungs stopped working, and they were going to put him on a machine that would bypass the lungs and oxygenate his lungs or oxygenate his blood directly, avoiding uh, skipping his lungs so that they would have a chance to heal and be restored. When his lungs weren't working, he was comatose. He was in a coma. He was completely paralyzed. He couldn't hear us, see us, talk to us. It affected so many of the other elements of his body. And we have that impact on each other. When we are the body of Christ together, we have a huge impact on each other. If you are part of this community, then you take on roles in this community. You do the things that God's called you to do within the community. Not everybody does the same thing. Scripture says that God's appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administration, various kinds of tongues. And then it recognizes that not everyone has all of those gifts. There are some who are really good teachers in this community, and some of us who aren't. There are some of us who are really good at ministering. Their name is not Rod. If we put Rod in charge of administration, wow, we have a disaster. We kind of have a disaster anyway because Eric went on vacation, so it may say something about his administrative gifts because our computer screwed up and suddenly, I don't know why, but whenever Eric goes on vacation, it's suddenly 110 degrees outside. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know what he does, what his gifts of cooling are, but apparently he has gifts of cooling and, and he takes them with him when he leaves. <laughs> it's, it's weird because we all have these unique things that we bring and we don't bring the same things. The gifts that you bring are important, and they're missed when you're not here, when you're not part of us. It says that we're to desire higher gifts. The higher gifts are to the highest gift of all is to love each other. There's no greater gift that God calls his people to that he gives us, and he gives us all the ability to love, to love deeply, to love intimately, to to love with whole hearts, to love each other. You can all desire that gift because that is the essence of who Christ is. When Christ comes, he comes as God, as we heard before in previous messages, he is God, fully God, and he's fully man. But his essence is love. God's essence is love. God doesn't love. We often say God loves me. No, God is love. He can't not love. It is not possible for him to not love. He is love. It is the definition of God. His definition of God is love. And so when Christ comes, he comes as the one who loves And he loves us fully and completely. He comes and lays down his life for us. He serves us. He sacrifices everything for us. He lays down his life for us. Then he comes out of the grave. He rises to heaven. He rules with God right now. And he calls us, his body, to come together. And we're doing that. This little tiny part of his body, this little expression here, out here in Tucson on Cloverland, because there's lots of other places where that body is expressed as well. This part of his body is called together to be here, and we're called to do that which is the greatest of all, which is to love. 
It's interesting because after Paul in Corinthians describes all these jobs and all these different tasks, he says, I'll show you a still more excellent way. And then we have the famous uh, 1 Corinthians 13 that you often hear at weddings, uh, the great love chapter of, of, of the scriptures where we talk about love. So God's calling us to be a people who love each other, to be set apart to love each other and to love the world around us. In Ephesians 1, 22, it says, He put all things under his feet. He, meaning God, put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. If the church is Christ's body, the head is Christ. That which controls the body, that which oversees the body, that which makes the body do what the body needs to do, that which brings healing to the body, that which offers itself to the body, is the head. It is that which leads. Christ, the head, and, and we collectively, the body of Christ. When Christ, when Jesus left, he said we would do greater things than he did. And when you read that, you go, really, how, how could that be true? That Nobody could be greater than Jesus. But in the collective, with the Spirit of God on us, the Holy Spirit t- teaching us and showing us his ways, and we walking in them collectively, we are able to do and far more than he could do. We can talk to people, far more people than he could talk to in his life. We can reach out far beyond where he could because of the body, being the body of Christ collectively together. When Timothy three fourteen through sixteen says, "I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that I, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory." Paul, in writing to Timothy, is saying, I want you to know how to behave in the household of God. I want you to know what you're supposed to be doing in the church of the living God. That church is, first of all, a pillar and a buttress of truth. It's the solid place where we can go. It's the place where we can get real, true counsel. It's where we can get the really true invitation into relationship with Jesus. It's the place where we can go, where we can confess um, not only our sin, but we can confess the greatness of God. This one who came was manifest among us and was taken up into glory and who rules still. So if you're part of the church, if you're part of this body, what do you do, right? What do you do? First of all, you walk in truth. You walk in truth. It's interesting that we don't often think of that as what our calling is. We hear a lot of lies. Most of us deal with lies that just keep getting repeated to us. And we hang on to those lies. When I was 16 and my dad died, I, uh, I prayed 
because the doctor asked me to, I prayed that my dad would go into a coma before he died so that he would die peacefully. And he did. My dad slipped into a coma and two days later he passed away without a horrible death struggle. And one of my friends in high school said, oh, too bad you didn't have more faith. If you'd have prayed he'd be alive, then he'd be alive now. If you'd have prayed he'd be healed, you'd be much better off. For the next umpteen years, I believed the lie that I killed my dad. I believed the lie that I killed things. It didn't help that a business that I was part of went bankrupt and disappeared. It didn't help that churches I came and preached at closed down. As a matter of fact, I helped close down several churches and people would refer to me as the Dr. Kevorkian of the church growth movement. <laughs> which was like very funny and stabbed me in the heart because I thought I killed things. I believed I killed things. It's the lie that Satan tells me still. Classist Arizona, which is a regional gathering of churches for the Christian Reformed Church, of which I am um, a, a pastor in good standing, this... I'm supposed to fly out in August to have a meeting about how to disband our, our regional church group and, and either scatter to other groups or do some of the, something else. Because um, they said, Classless Arizona is just dead. There's nothing happening. And there's the liar comes running to me and he says, and it's your fault. If you were better... If you did what you were supposed to do, if you had prayed the right prayers, if you had worked through the right work, if you had done what you're supposed to do, then everything would be okay. And it's your fault. That's what the liar does. And I need this community to remind me that I bring life, that I bring good things, that I bring joy, that I bring happiness, that I bring life itself, that I bring the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done to all of you. I need that reminder. You need those reminders. When you walk in the lies, you cannot believe those lies. The liar lies. That's what he does. He's an expert at it. He's always been good at it. He's, it's his nature. It's what he does. As much as it is God's nature to be love, to love, it is Satan's nature to lie. That's what he does. And so you walk in the truth. Walking in the truth doesn't mean understanding it intellectually and a, a saying, you know, yes, because I, you know, some of you say that to me. Rod, I know it's true, and then you put the word but. Okay? Nothing may ever come after the word but. Because there is no but. If you know what I'm saying is true, then it's true, period. <laughs> you don't say but. But I struggle. But I don't believe. But, but I had a hard time believing it. But I, I get that. But the invitation is to walk in truth. The invitation is to live out truth. To in your daily walk with God, to believe the truth. And for that you need community. You need each other. You need the holy Catholic Church. So, walk in truth. The second thing that you can do is you can walk in godliness. You can take on, you can study who Jesus is and you can learn of him and his ways and you can live out those ways. You can make yourself accessible to the head. You can say, head, Jesus I want to serve you. I want to do what it is you would have me do. If you want me to suffer, I'm willing to suffer. If you want me to lead, I'm willing to lead. If you want me to clean the building, I'll clean the building. See, some of you think it's Eric and Rod that are asking you to clean the building. We're not. I'm a slob. I'm used to living in a slob. I... It doesn't bother me at all. 
It doesn't bother me if none of you want to take, take care of the kids. I don't care. I love it when the kids are in here and noisy and raucous and yelling and babies are crying. You might get a little irritated because you can't hear. Oh, well. <sighs> Fix it. Maybe you're called to do marvelous, wonderful things. Most likely you're called to do servant things. I always love this about Eric. Kind of sad that he's actually visiting tonight because I didn't want to say this in front of him. I love that he takes out the garbage as the last thing that he does before he, when we lock up on Sunday nights. He wheels those garbage cans out to the street because the garbage man is going to come tomorrow. I love that about him. Because we like to think, oh, Eric is the pastor. Eric is the leader. Eric's the guy who doesn't do that stuff. No, he takes out the trash. He cleans the toilets. The measure in the upside-down kingdom of the Holy Catholic Church, the measure of your prestige is not in the big things you do. It's in the little things. It's where you serve. The kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. You want to be the greatest of all? Clean the toilets. You want to be the greatest of all? Take out the trash. You want to be the greatest of all? Wash up the dishes later tonight. You want to be the greatest of all? Walk around and clean up the mess. Straighten out the chairs. Put this place back where it belongs. The invitation to us is to serve each other. To love each other enough to serve each other. To go to each other and say, what can I do for you? Not, what can you do for me? Certainly, some of you have gifts of teaching, healing, speaking the truth. Those are all beautiful things, and you earn the right to use those gifts when you serve. The body of Christ is gathered to serve the King of Kings, to serve God himself, and we do that by serving each other. Some of us like to think, oh, I serve God. Like that's some kind of holy thing that we... You know how you serve God? You serve God by serving people. Go read the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Read them over several times. Just read them in order. You'll hear that constantly, constantly, constantly. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing of putting others first, serving others, living for others. People say they love their brother. I mean, say they love God but hate their brother. Doesn't work. You can't love God and say, but I can't stand Pastor Rod because he keeps stepping on my toes and irritating me. Doesn't work that way. You can't be driven by the head, which is a head that loves and sacrifices and lays down his life You can't be driven by that great head, Jesus Christ, and hate and despise and be angry with and not deal promptly with your sin. And it's that last place that I want to close this message. The church, the holy, the set-apart the universal, all time, all place, everywhere, Catholic church, those who have been called out of their houses to gather together, to commune with Christ, to take his body and blood and take it in. Saints, you saints, set apart the cleaned up ones. You need to be in the business of cleaning up. We used to call the healing chair back there the sinner's chair. And I had the seven deadly sins I painted on there. And I noticed people were nervous about sitting in it. 
I liked that they were nervous. Thousands of sins were confessed in that, in that chair. We can all tell stories of our sin that was confessed in that chair. I remember when Eric drug it up here and preached a sermon from it, starting a sermon by saying, I'm a liar. It's one of the greatest sermons I've heard him preach. Because we're sinners. Yeah, we're saints. We're the cleaned up ones. We are cleaned up. In God's eyes, we are already clean because of the work of Jesus Christ. But from here, in our time and in our place, together, we are being cleaned up. We're being scrubbed up. We're being healed. We're being made right. And to do that, you need to confess your sins one to another. Scripture says, confess your sin. Acknowledge it to each other. You don't need to go tell the bartender that you're cheating on your wife. What you need to do is come here and say it to people who will walk with you, who will say, ooh, that's not right. Ooh, that's a wound to the body. We want to change this. You come here and say, I'm drinking way too much. I can't handle it anymore. You come here and you say that, and we go, ooh, ouch, that hurts the body. Let's walk with you in that. Let us help you. You don't come. You have to come here and and say, "Here's I, I'm struggling with anger. I I I hate my life. I don't like what's going on. I I just I can't deal with it anymore." You come here to this place and you share it with these people. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. It's delightful to be part of the set-apart through all time and all space and all place. To be called out of your house into communion and to be cleaned up. We're not alone in this. The church all around us, this huge church, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, one of my favorite passages. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're surrounded by a whole cloud of witnesses. All those who've gone before are looking down and they're applauding, they're clapping, they're cheering. Go, Rod, go, Rod, you can do this. Go, Mike, you can do this. It's going to happen. I know it's going to be okay. You know what? Tamaki, you've got it. It's going to be okay. I'm cheering for you. We're up here yelling for you. Saying, go ahead. You can make the finish line. You can do it. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're old like John. <laughs> Jesus is even cheering for John. And so is that whole cloud of witnesses. Right? The whole cloud of witnesses going, yes, you can do it. You can do it. Why? Not because of how great you are, because of how strong you are, because of the talent you have, because of the ability you have. No, because Jesus has done it for you. And he will draw you to himself. And he draws us to himself. And there comes that great day when the body of Christ joins the head and there's this beautiful, eternal togetherness. Jesus, God, and us, his body. I look forward to that day. Let's pray.